for that. You know, we're just totally grateful, and, and off, off, oftentimes, like, I think uh, we get into a rhythm of doing church, and, and, and including myself, and we kind of forget how blessed we are to be able to meet in this type of space with, with these type of people, and, and so um, bless our time together, uh, let us not take it for granted, and we pray all these things in their name, amen. amen. So we're on the fourth value um, that, of, of our sermon series where we describe the church in different metaphors. Uh, the first one was church as a family. The second one was church as the bride of Christ. And the third one was a church as servants of the community. And the fourth one that we want to talk about today is the church as the body of Christ. And the book that we're going to talk about is, is the book of Corinthians. Now, the Corinthians, um, the, the book is just a very rich book. It has, it has a lot of things going on in this book, and one of the themes and one of the things that's going on in the Church of Corinth back in those days was that there were extremely, uh, an, an exorbitant amount of, of divisions. There were a lot, a lot of divisions going on in this church. And it, it's kind of funny because when the Apostle Paul originally went there, uh, there was this huge revival that was taking place in that church. And, and, and people were just excited, people were coming together, and then once he left, all these divisions started taking place. And so you had, you had all people disagreeing over all kinds of things. I mean, you had the Greeks who were very philosophical. Uh, you had the Jews who were, who were very spiritual. And so amongst them, they were disagreeing. Even amongst the Jewish community, they were disagreeing, right, the Jewish Christians. And what their disagreement was about who was the most spiritual, right, which is kind of funny to me. That's like a, to me, that's a little bit of a, a oxymoron, a contradiction, right, to argue about who's the most spiritual. But they were arguing about who was the most spiritual, right, and then there were divisions about leadership, uh, some people wanted to follow the Apostle Paul. Some people were, were claiming that they were um, uh, Apostle Peter supporters and, and, and Apollo supporters. And, and so there, there were divisions within the leadership. There was divisions within culture. There was those who were eating certain types of food and who weren't. I mean, so there were all different types of divisions that were going on in the church of Corinth. And the Apostle Paul, in, in the book of Corinthians, he addresses it like this. He says, on the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable, and the parts that we think are less honorable we treat with special honor. And the parts that are unpresentable are treated with special modesty, while our presentable parts need no special treatment. But God has put the body together, giving greater honor to the parts that lacked it, so that there should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. Now, what it's saying in this passage is that when we look at the Bible, when we look at, uh, when we look at the first century Christian church, what was going on was that there were certain things, that, certain people in the church that were presented as being more important than other people. And what the Apostle Paul was saying, well, with those people, you know, they already get the special treatment. You don't, we don't need to actually honor them anymore. But those people who aren't getting recognized, those people who aren't getting special treatment, we need to lift those people up. We need to acknowledge those people. Because in the body of Christ, we have equal concern for one another. So the first point that we recognize is that in the body of Christ, we are all equal. Now, this is an extremely, extremely important point to remember. And, and I think... Idealistically speaking, as a society, we can acknowledge that that is kind of a correct thing to think, right? Like, like that, like you rarely come across people, I mean, it happens, right? But you rarely come across people who won't think that this is actually a good thing. But right? most people today, at least living in New York City, when you come across them, when you talk to them, they'll say, yeah, we're equal. Like, people should be treated equally. But do we actually practice that? Right? Do we actually practice that? I mean, if somebody came in here who I think is an extremely important person, would I treat that person exactly the same way that I would treat everybody else? If Tim Keller, my idol, right, and I struggle with this very much, if Tim Keller, lead pastor of Redeemer Presbyterian Church, comes through those doors, would I treat Tim Keller the same exact way? Right? That, that I would treat everybody else. No, I, oh my gosh, it's Tim Keller! Get the special chair, right? I mean, I, I don't know if I do that. In fact, in a day-to-day -day life, we say that, we speak that, but how, do we, how often do we really actually live that way, even as we interact with society? You know, my, my, my wife, for example, she was a, she was a waitress, and, and she has all these kind of stories about people that were just nasty to her when she was in the service industry. Okay? Now, do we, do we treat those type of people in the service industry the same place as, as we would treat people that we see, deem with, like, like the Tim Kellers of the world or the people that, that we deem... As, as being especially honorable. No. Because in our minds, in our hearts, we've already placed that there are certain people that we value over other people. 
Or my mom, she, she runs an uh, eyeglass store, and she says every single day she sees, she sees the brokenness of people. And she sees the distinctions between those people who are serving, I guess, as the, as a, the optometrist or versus those people who are just kind of in the retail. And, and, and she sees the way that people are. You can totally see the way on a day-to-day -day life that people live, the way people treat people, that we, we always contradict that, that we actually may say that we believe that people are equal, but do we actually treat people that way? And what this passage is saying is that in the body of Christ, there is none of that. That in the body of Christ, people are equal. That, that, that there is no such thing. Yes, we may have different functions, but we are equals. That is a truth. That is a biblical truth in the body of Christ. In fact, we even, we even practice this today in church, right? Like, um, so I was, I was a youth pastor for five years. And a very, very strange uh, uh, in, in, in my former church, they, they used to really lift pastors up, right? And it was kind of weird at times because um, one time I remember I was a youth pastor, and we did an event, and all the parents were kind of just standing there after the event, and, and it was time to eat. So I said, I said, you know, why aren't you eating? And they said, we're not allowed to eat until the pastor eats first. And that was, like, I wasn't even hungry. So I was like, I was getting angry about this tradition, right? I'm, I don't, I'm not even hungry. This, why don't you eat first? Like, no, no, we can't do that. We can't do that because we're not allowed to eat until the pastor eats first. And so I ate, and I was angry about eating because I wasn't even hungry, but I needed to do it so that these people could eat. And, and you know, there's some traditions. Like, I'm not making fun of traditions in itself. I think traditions are a great thing, right? In fact, the gospel is meant to be celebrated within the lens of traditions. Make no mistake about that. Right? That is, that's actually a biblical truth that I've once preached on. The gospel has to be celebrated within the context of traditions, but some traditions just got to go. Like that one there, that got to go. Because we are equals in the body of Christ. In fact, this is the way the kingdom of heaven works. If you ever read the Beatitudes, I'm just going to read one part of the Beatitudes. And it says, blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Now this word meek, what does that mean? Now this word, this word actually has a lot of connotations. It means... The weak, the low, the humble. Now what is, this, what is this passage saying? It's saying that in God's eyes, in the kingdom of heaven, he does not view things the same way that we view things. The same people that we hold in such high esteem, that's not the truth with God. In fact, in the kingdom of heaven, in God's eyes, things are reversed. And those who are humble, those who are, are weak, those who are low, they will be elevated, that they will inherit the earth, that they will inherit the kingdom of heaven, that there's a reversal of values in the kingdom of heaven in God's eyes. In fact, in, in the kingdom of heaven, we are all simply weak. We are all simply low. We are all simply humble. And the, and the only thing that lifts us up is Jesus Christ. And that's why we're equals. We're equals because we are all broken. And the only thing that we lifts us up and puts us into a higher status is Jesus Christ. The second thing I want to notate about this particular passage, um, it says, on the contrary, now, now we see the, the word parts being used a lot here. Those are parts of the body that seem to be weaker. And, and, and parts that we think are less honorable and parts that are unpresentable are treated with special modesty. right? And, and, and once again, we see this kind of like, there's a body, but there's different parts. And, and, and I'm not going to go over it today, but you know, if you ever elaborate further into this passage, it talks about kind of like how the, uh, the eyes have different functions and, and the ear has different functions and, and hands. Right? So it, it talks about different functions of the body of Christ. So this, this, the second point that we notate in this passage is that in the body of Christ, the members have various functions. <clears throat> so I had the pleasure of like, you know, um, of, of uh, meeting up with Tim Keller once a month uh, in this program. The five of us, we got to meet up with Tim Keller once a month. And if you're thinking that I'm showing off, I kind of am, right? So, so I got the pleasure of doing that. And, um, and, I, and I sat with Tim Keller, and I've asked him questions. I said, I said, you know, one of the questions I asked him was, what was one of your biggest struggles as a pastor? Because if you don't know, he's, he's about to go into retirement, and he's about to um, do other things. Uh, so I said, what was your biggest struggle as a pastor? And he tells me, one of my, my biggest struggle was that when, when I used to do church, what ended, ended up happening was he became such a big celebrity pastor, 
right? Everybody wanted to come see him because he was, he was known as the best preacher in New York City, if not the best preacher in all of the country, right? So people from outside the country would come see him. People from outside the states would come see him. So many people were coming to see Tim Keller. And what he said was that all these people were coming and sitting down to see Tim Keller preach, but they weren't being active, functional members of the body of Christ. And, and, and what he says, and, and, and I'll never forget, he, he says to me, and I'm paraphrasing this, because I don't remember exactly, but even if I said it the same way, it sounds better when he says it, right? <laughs> and I, I, I put this to the test before. Like, I've actually said to a friend, um, we're like, this is a total tangent, by the way. I actually said to a friend, like, you know, why we're church planning all this stuff. And he said, yeah, you know, what I'm not. And I quoted all these statistics. I, I basically said the, the, the same things that I've heard from him, right? And I said, and I quoted, I said you know, yeah, this is why we're church planning. And then later on, I showed him a video of Tim Keller saying the exact same things. He's like, oh, wow, that makes a lot of sense. <laughs> so, I mean, I don't know. Anyways. Um, <laughs> I don't know if you ever put that. You should put that to the test just to see how it works. So anyway, so, I, so I, I'm talking to Tim and, and I asked him about the struggles, and he tells me about how his members weren't getting plugged in. They weren't being functional members of the body of Christ. And this is what he says to me. He says, he says, David, if the members of your church are not getting plugged in, if they're not getting plugged into the community, they're not, they're not being functional members of the church, they're not contributing in any way whatsoever, and, and they're just not being functional here at all, it was then your church is actually not a church. Your church is just a Sunday event that happens once a week. That's what he says. Now, I have to make a huge disclaimer here. Uh, I mean, this is, this is huge. I have to make this disclaimer. That I believe in seasons. Okay, I believe in seasons. And, and I've, I've, in terms of the way and our rhythms go and the way that, that they, those, are, those things are between you and God. Right? And I believe in seasons, right? I believe that I've told people that, that you're not really in a place to dive fully into this right now. I, 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 you need to kind of take a step back. I've told people personally that because I believe in seasons. I really do. Right? And then there's people that have been hurt by churches. There's just people that have been abused. I mean, all kinds of stories that I hear. So I believe 100% in seasons. And those are things for individuals to discern. Right? And, and then for, for me to pray over them with individuals. And for, for individuals to ultimately have convictions from God in, as to what season you're in. Right? So I'm not saying that everybody in this church should dive in right now all at once. That's not what I'm saying. And I'm not even saying that we all have the same function. I remember I met this old, old lady one time. She, she would just come in, and she would sit in the back every single time uh, when I was in Astoria Church. And she would just sit there all, every single week. She would, she would sit there, sit there. And, 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 and I was just so intrigued because she wouldn't really kind of, you know, um, she couldn't move around. So she couldn't really, like, interact with many people. But she would sit there every single week. So I'd come and, and talk to her week after week after week. And I remember as I was learning more, what, what was really her passion was that she said she loves coming here and sitting down in the back and just praying for the church. And she says, every week I, I come here and I sit down and just sit down in the back and I just intercede for the pastor. And once again, we're in different seasons. And here's the thing that I, I want to challenge. We're in different seasons, but, but if, you're, if, you're, if, you're, if, you're, if you don't feel like you're called to that season, or maybe you've just kind of been coming here and checking it out and everything like that, which is totally fine, which is totally cool, right? I'm not you know, judging you for that in any way whatsoever. What I'm saying is that I truly hope from the bottom of my heart that that is not your intention for the rest of your life. And the reason why I'm saying that is because if that's true, then that's just too sad for me. Like, that is just too sad. Because we live in New York City. In New York City, you have so many options. So many pastors, right? So many sermons, so many um, churches, so many facilities, so many amenities, so many worship styles, so many prayer styles, so many different types of churches that you can actually live your entire life going to a church Getting something out of it that, that you want, right, after going Sunday after Sunday, Sunday, getting bored of it, and trying to move on to the next thing that kind of interests you. And I've seen people that have lived their entire life in New York City this way. You can actually live your entire life in New York City this way. And for me, that's just too sad. So the second point, in the body of Christ, we have various functions. And the third point I want to make actually comes from a different part of the passage of the Corinthians. It says, just that the body, though one has many parts, but all of its many parts form one body. So that it is with Christ, for we were all baptized in, this, in one spirit, so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, so race, culture, slave or free, socioeconomic classes, and we were all given one spirit to drink. Even so, the body is not made of um, the body is not made of one part, but of many. What it's actually saying is that even though we have different functions, we actually have different parts, we are all still one. 
But what does it mean to be one? So um, in college, I was on the crew team. For those of you who don't know what the crew team is, it's, it's the rowing team. And I know if you look at me, and that's, that's unbelievable. But, uh, OK, so it's the rowing team. And, and, and these guys were, most of these guys were like six foot three, like huge built jack guys, jocks. And, and so I was always in the, in the back. It's called the bow. And they always say the bow is all long for the ride. So they always put me in the back, right? And, um, and I was sitting in the back. And I have to get out anytime I got stuck in the sand and push it. It was just terrible. But anyway, so I'm on the crew team. And, and I look at our boat. And, and we had some of the most like jacked built guys, like really built guys. Some of these guys may have been on something. Like it was just, they were, it was just we recruited like this really, really like scary looking lineup of guys, right? So we were we were hyping up our, our team. Like, oh my gosh, have you seen our team? Our team, you know, they look scary, right? And I was hyping them up. And and in in crew we had what's called a novice A and novice B, right? Novice B, we were the first years, and novice A was the second years. Um, and, and then you get to, you reach varsity. That that's how it worked. So we had novice A, novice B, and I was I was. Um, you know, on, on, on the first year team, right, the novice B team, and we were so cocky. We were like, you know, I was like, look at these guys, you know. And I looked at the novice A team, and they weren't nearly as big, right? They weren't nearly as tall. They didn't nearly have as long strokes as these guys. And by the way, in crew, you lose, lose a lot of your legs, so strokes are huge in crew, right? You kick off with your legs. So I'm looking at this, and I'm saying, man, this is gonna be, this is gonna be a piece of cake. Like, we're, we're gonna destroy these guys. So one day, I, I, we challenged novice A to a, to a match. We said, hey guys, I, I want to challenge you guys personally to a match. So we get ready, and I'm like, oh man, we're going to kill these guys. And then as soon as they say, you know, runners on your mark, it's set. And then they go, I mean, they, and then they go, go. And then we start going. And, and I remember we're just like going all out. Like we're screaming, ah, and we're, we're rolling. We're like, oh, we're like screaming our heads off. And I'm looking at these guys. These guys are like rolling with all of their might. And the other boat just goes flying, shoom. Like they're just way ahead. And I cannot believe how far ahead they are. And I'm looking at them from a distance, and I'm like, I, I cannot, my mind cannot comprehend how they made it that far already. So one day, I decided to actually stay behind them, watch them practice. And it was the most incredible thing. I, I watched them practice, and they, they would, they had these huge, I mean, they, they, they had, we had these huge guys, and we all stood there, and we watched these guys practice who weren't as big, who weren't as strong. And as I was watching them practice, it was so impressive. What they would do was, they would actually practice this drill. Now, for those of you who know what a crew boat looks like, it's extremely narrow. So the slightest lean to the left tips the boat. The slightest lean to the right tips the boat. The slightest oar that's off balance with the oar that's on, on this side tips the boat, right? So that's the way crew works. So I would watch them do it, and as they were rowing, they were rowing, they were rowing, the person in the front who's the leader says, stop, and they all stop. What they do, instead of putting their oars down, they put it straight out so that it's equally balanced. With the, boat, with, the, with the oar next to it. Now, when they would do this, they would roll so vigorously, they would stop, and they would just quickly, like all at once, just equalize. And when you watch them, they were so together. It was like they were so in sync that everything had to be in sync. See, that's why I think crew is like the ultimate crew, uh, team sport, because even if the guy on the right is slightly off from the guy on the left, there's eight people on the boat, the entire boat just gets thrown off. The entire boat shakes. So the key to crew is that everybody, all eight people, have to be exactly in sync with one another. That is incredibly hard because here's the thing. What I realized, this is why it's so hard in crew. Because there's guys who are stronger than others. There's guys who are taller than others. right? There's guys who are just more driven than others. But everybody has to be equal. So the guys who are stronger than the, the people who are weaker, the guys who have longer strokes, have to actually shorten their strokes. And they, don't, they, they have to actually uh, try not to roll as hard to match the person on the other side. And this is what I realized, and it's because this is why I call crew ultimate team sport, because if you want to do that, it takes enormous amounts of ego sacrifice. Like you have to sacrifice yourself as being the strongest person on the boat to match everybody else's speed and everybody else's strength. Right? That's how crew works. Right? And in the, what we realize, in order for us to be one, whether, it takes, whether we're talking about marriage, whether we're talking about teen sports, whether we're talking about church, the body of Christ, always, if you want to be one, there has to be sacrifice. So here's the three things. In the body of Christ, we are called to be equal. In the body of Christ, we are functional members of society. I mean, functional members of the church. And in the body we of Christ, we are all called to be one. And it's very, it's very, I mean, this, this, this idea of sacrifice, this idea of being called to be one. You know, I, I think about this idea, and um, 
I think about like if you ever look at Christian history in the 11th century, there was what's called the Great Schism. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but um, the East and the West had a huge argument with each other, and they basically the, the church was just torn for a long period of time, right? And, and we we still have some residual effects of that. And so the church was torn. But but if you actually look at the church history, a lot of it was because pride was offended. A lot of it was because communication didn't go through. A lot of people it was because people didn't want to bother. And what I realized is that what's sad about the Great Schism is that, in my opinion, when I read that history, if somebody was just willing to sacrifice their pride, they may have actually said, the two sides may have actually said, let's agree to disagree, but we're still going to be amicable with each other because we are still one body. We are still the body of Christ. But instead, what they did was they were so angry at each other that there was all this tension for years and years and years because nobody wanted to sacrifice their pride. Nobody wanted to make that particular sacrifice, so therefore it was... They were divided. And here's the thing. When churches get divided, and I know some of this makes you cringe because some of you guys have experienced this in your past. right? Some of you guys have seen churches divided. Some of you guys have seen really, really ugly things. It always starts because somebody doesn't want to make a sacrifice. But not just sacrifice. How do I put this? Somebody doesn't want to make a sacrifice without getting something in return. So let me explain. Um, in Jesus Christ, in one, of the, in one of the parables, I'm not going to explain it because I've explained it in a previous sermon, right? In one of the parables, what Jesus Christ says is that, is that when you invite people over to your house, don't invite your, your sister, your brother, your parents. Don't invite rich people. And, and, and the passage doesn't really even seem to make sense at face value. But when you look into the passage deeper, what Jesus Christ is actually saying is that don't invite people over that are going to give you something back in return. Right? That's what he's actually saying. Right? He's, he's, he's trying to make that example. I mean, Jesus Christ did invite over his brothers. And, and said, yeah, he did invite family members over his house. So he's not literally saying that. But what he's actually saying is that when you invite people over, don't expect anything in return. Now, this is extremely difficult because sometimes it's just so subtle. And I'll tell you how subtle this is. So one time I met with a, uh, an elder at, at, at my former church, and he's a terrific man, very pleasant man. I, I love talking to him. And he, once in a while, he's like, hey, David, I want to buy you dinner. So I get really excited about this. He, he, he invites me, and we, we, we talk. And, and one of the things he says, hey, David, how can we benefit the youth ministry? That's like a dream for a youth pastor, right? Like when someone tells you that, that's like a dream. Like you never hear that, right? So he says, how can we benefit the youth ministry? I want to help you. I want to benefit the youth ministry. And I'm thinking, this man is great. I love this, right? And, and, and I said, you know, I, I started naming off things. I said, well, we need this, we need this, you know. And, and I was telling him, like, certain things that we needed. And he was great. It was all done. He said, you got it. And I was so curious that I said, how are you going to do this? <laughs> and he says to me, I'll never forget, he says to me, David, I've given a lot of money to this church. Now, this is, this is, the reason why this is so complex is because at face value, that doesn't necessarily just, like, at face value, that doesn't really seem like a bad thing, right? Because, I mean, he did that expecting and wanting to actually make a change, right? Well, what if, what if, he, what if he actually donated a lot of money because he wanted to get in a position of power in politics so that he could make a change, right? So that maybe he could help youth ministry. At face value, that doesn't even seem like a bad thing, right? Like, I look at that, so at face value, I'm like, well, what's so bad about that? He just wants to make a change. His heart is good. But here's the problem. What happens when he doesn't get what he wants? He becomes an extremely entitled, angry, bitter man. And that's how it is so subtle. That sacrificing is so subtle. Sacrificing without expecting something in return is so subtle. Because it's, it's, it's even as subtle as that. It could even be a good thing. It could even be a positive thing. But if we don't dig deeper, if we don't self-reflect deeper, it could actually be coming from a place of darkness. So how do we do these kind of, I mean, like, what, what, what is the focus? And, and you guys always know I tie it into the gospel. But here's something that's very interesting that I read. Uh, in, in the passage in 1 Corinthians 12, 27, it says, Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. Now, when I look at this passage, it's very interesting. Let's listen. Now we're the body of Christ, and each one of you is part of it. Now, here's the thing. When we generally look at this, we say, oh, that's kind of like just like a metaphor, right? That's kind of a metaphor. You know, maybe it's not literally saying, you know, we're, we're a body of Christ. But here's the thing. What if it's actually speaking truth? What if we really are part of the body of Christ? 
What if we are part of something bigger? What if our identity is no longer David or James? But what if it's Jesus? You see, when Jesus Christ goes to that cross and he sacrifices, something happens. See, when God, God looked at us, right, he looked at Jesus Christ and he was a perfect being. My son, this is what I'm pleased. And then God looks at us and, man, <laughs> broken, betrayers, uh, child molesters, you know, I and mean, just total utter brokenness. People who can't control themselves from addictions and just looks like complete filth. But then when Jesus Christ dies on that cross, he looks at us, and he looks at Jesus, and all of a sudden, we're the same. All of a sudden, he, he can't tell the difference, because we've been clothed with Christ's righteousness. So we're now exactly the same. So what does it ultimately mean to be the part of the body of Christ? It means that when God looks at us, he looks at us exactly the same way that he looks at Jesus Christ. He's not looking at James the sinner, David the sinner. He's looking at perfect righteous beings, perfect righteous sons and daughters of Christ. If we can just go to him in a time of prayer and ask the worship team to come up. And here's the thing that I want to challenge us with today um, on this particular Sunday morning. Uh, the body of Christ is so much deeper than just being a part of a regular community. I mean, anybody could be a part of it. There's tons of different communities that you can find. Um, there's tons of different communities that provide the same, maybe amenities or, or, or facilities or maybe even communities or even good people. I don't know. There, there, there's all different types of communities. What distinguishes the church body from all of these other communities it is the fact that we are now clothed with